Hi everyone. Um, my name's Jed. I'm from Sydney. Uh, as you just heard, I co-founded a company called ThinkMill. We're a development consultancy. Um, this is kind of eerie. I also run React Sydney, so it's kind of cool. You can fly all the way around the world and end up in a room full of enthusiastic React developers in a meetup. Um, only the view is different. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. Um, I'm also an, open, uh, an avid open source contributor. Um, this is kind of something we try and encourage at ThinkMill. And some of the stuff you may or may not have used, like class names or style components, come, came from us in Sydney. And today, so what I wanted to do was tell you a bit of a story about one of these components, which is React Select, and an adventure that we've on, been on recently around it. So just up front, forgive me if I sound a bit tired. I flew for 28 hours, and my body thinks I just pulled an all-nighter, and it's currently 10 AM. Um, so sleep will actually be a bit of a recurring theme in this talk. Um, that's just where it starts. But So this is a story of one component with hundreds of use cases and millions of open source users. Um, just to start with, let's think about a select for a, for a second. It seems pretty simple. Like I wanted to build a select. That's how this started about three and a half years ago. How hard could that possibly be? Uh, turns out there's a few things you need to deal with when you're building a select. You've got stuff like a focused state. And then this thing like a menu. Um, interestingly, you've got some questions you're already asking yourself, like what is actually focused? It looks like I could type into that input. But also, it looks like that first option is selected. Uh, we then have some more functionality, like we could group items. Um, we could type in and wait for some results to load. We could select something, need to be able to clear it. We might want to introduce some custom styling. If I picked a color, I'll have a little dot next to it. We might want to multi-select. We might want some custom, custom styling in the multi-select. You've also got to deal with other states, like disabled, um, or even if you wanted to create a new thing. So a little bit of background on how we got to what I'm going to present. Um, ThinkMill in Sydney, we've been helping Atlassian build their new UI library, Atlas Kit. And this has been quite an adventure, because they've got a huge amount of scale and sort of really big requirements for this. This is rolling out through all of their products. And one of the things that kind of has come up again and again as a thing that we wanted to address really well in this library is the select component. So Atlassian have hundreds, maybe thousands of select components across their products. If you think about JIRA, it's basically a glorified form, and most of the inputs are actually selects. So we, or they use it for things like assigning tasks to users, selecting states and options, changing filters, uh, adding people to rooms in stride. All of this sort of stuff is actually the core user experience for this is a select component. This is where it starts getting complicated. You end up with a whole lot of different things that you might want to kind of do or not do depending on what you're trying to achieve with your select as a user experience. Um, it might be searchable or it might not. It might be a single select or it might be a multi-select. You might have preloaded some options or you may need to asynchronously load them from the database. Uh, you might be working with existing options or you may need to create new options. And this is, trust me, really just scratching the surface of what you might want to change about this one single, tiny, trivial little component. So we get to thinking about what's the best way to approach this if you're building a, a generic user interface component. How do you want to kind of meet all of these different use cases? Um, what was in place when we started working with it was actually different components. This seems like a good idea. You've got a single select and a multi-select. And then so that you can match different use cases, you'd address like a stateless version that you could totally control, or a stateful version that would do a lot of the inbuilt logic for you. Um, another valid option would be to try and use one component. The challenge with one component is that if this is, this is not a select. I know it looks like I'm drawing a select, but I'm not. This is, imagine this is like a bar graph of all of the functionality that you might want to have. Um, so user number one is going to want to just customize this part of it. User two, maybe this part, and user three, this part. What you end up with is like the total surface area of what could be customizable in the component is actually quite a lot. And then in advanced use cases, the trick is you're actually probably only still customizing a little bit of all of the available functionality. The rest of it, you want to work the way it was designed to work originally. So coming into this challenge, I had some of my own thoughts on this. I wrote React Select. Um, this is pretty cool. I, I started this because there were no other select components, and this was several years ago. Uh, turns out, just probably because I was the first, it's become quite popular. Um, that's just over a million downloads per month that that's getting. 
And you're like, yay, successful open source author. You get really excited, you get all these stars. And then you realize that you've also got all these issues. <laughs> and then there are all these pull requests, and then you realize what you've done to yourself. <laughs> like, ah, okay. So at this stage in the project, it's quite mature. Um, and there's some good and some bad in here. We have around about 100 props in the current stable version, which is, some might say, too many for a single component. Uh, the problem is I know how we got here. They all actually make sense. Um, it also, because it has so many complicated behaviors, managing focus, managing value, a lot of internal state. Um, what it does a great job of is mapping some fundamentally declarative APIs under the hood that the browser is exposing to an imperative API that you can use in your React app. Uh, but this also means it has quite a locked down API. And the downside to the lockdown API is that for every change that you'd want to have that might alter this behavior, you do end up with another one of these props. Um, we also have a CSS class name kind of styling API, which means we get to ship styles out of the box that work. We had less styles so that people could change the theming or they can provide their own CSS. Uh, someone actually ported our less to SAS. The problem is now we're maintaining two style sheets plus the build in parallel. Uh, it got a bit crazy. So we looked at this and we said, okay, a lot of the stuff that we want in the future in Atlas Kit is actually available in React Select, but it's also, it, it's kind of crazy. Uh, it does a lot of stuff and it's not exactly the way that we wanted it to happen. So should we do this or not? And the question came up, why would we leverage open source to do this? Um, so, well, first of all, we have a million testers. That's pretty cool. Um, we have hundreds of contributors. We have unlimited requirements. What else do you want in a software project? Um, but we also have a solid and scalable setup and a really active community that's been helping drive a lot of maturity into this project for years now. Um, so there is some good, there are also some challenges, but okay, let's just think about this a little bit more. I don't get enough sleep, not just when I'm traveling. I definitely suffer maintainers' anxiety, that number of issues that I haven't responded to and the PRs coming in where people are trying to contribute to a project um, and you just don't have enough time in the day to get to it. Uh, all these use cases have led to more props and logic internally. What if there's a way to solve this? How can we take a step back? How can we think about the way that the architecture of the component works and what it's trying to do and actually solve the problems that I've just outlined and also bring forward all of the, the goodness that was present in this project. So we started again. Um, and what I'm introducing today is React Select -like version 2, which is currently almost finished its kind of development period. Uh, and also, that's a basis for the open source Atlas Kit Select as well. So the things that we came up with to solve these problems were allowing people to provide flexible data structures. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, customizable functions, so if you can BYO data structure, you kind of need to BYO in logic to work with that. An extensible CSS and JS styling framework, um, something that I've dubbed a component injection API. I haven't seen it done a lot. I'm really kind of excited to be out here talking about it now because although there's definitely prior art, I think that we've taken it to a new level uh, as, a, as a pattern for components. And then also independently controllable props, which is, again, absolutely prior art, but something that we're doing a little bit uh, more than I've seen done in other components. So what we've done is taken this much customizable functionality, broken it up into four distinct areas that actually are a little bit more manageable. Uh, what does that mean? I just spat a lot of gibberish at a room in an Aussie accent. Um, let's, let's break this down. So there's data, there are functions, there are components, and there are styles. Here's how that looks when you're trying to extend the component. Um, imagine the simplest select implementation that you could. This is a list of my favorite meetups in Sydney. Um, we're going to pass them to the selectors options. Now let's say that we wanted to customize something about this select, like the label of the current option. What we could do is, this is component injection at work. We could provide a different option component that gets rendered when the menu is being uh, displayed. We're just using that to put the label into div. This is all simplified, by the way. And if I've got any typos, I did write this code in Keynote. Uh, but what that now lets us do is, for example, put a logo. Like, let's say we have all of our images keyed by the value, and we want to put that beside the selected value. We can do that now just by replacing that component. Um, now, let's say that all these, just to extend that branding concept a bit further, let's say that all these meetups have a color. 
So this would be their colors. And this is now the extensible data concept at work, where because all of the values that we're operating on are user provided, we can actually let them put anything in there that they like. And then all of our extensible kind of API hooks give you back that data. So what we can do is now use our styling framework to style the label for the option with the color of the meetup that's just coming through that data structure. Uh, we're starting to really liberate the API of what you can do here without actually affecting the base functionality of the component. Um, now, you may not want to have a label and a value key inside your option. That's OK. We've gone a step further and said, well, you can actually override the built-in uh, functions that we've got for filtering options, for detecting whether options are disabled, for deciding whether or not they're selected based on the current value. Um, and now we're starting to get to a really powerful API, again, without actually needing to expose any of the internal functional pathways as props. Um, so the last piece that really made this feel scalable was this controllable props concept. Uh, now, you're actually, who's familiar with controlled props? It's kind of a core React concept. If you used an input, then you're familiar with this. The value, uh, if you provide it as a prop to an input, it, it will not change unless you change it. No matter what you type into a browser, it is always going to be what you set. You need to also subscribe to the onChange. However, if you don't want that, if you're just using it in an HTML form, you could provide a default value, not control the value prop, and then your changes as a user will go through, and it gets submitted with the form. So what that looks like is we have this select component, and we've blown out this concept a bit. Uh, simple things that used to be statefully driven in version 1 are now controlled by props, like should I show this component in a loading state? Let's just make that a prop. Uh, what about the value? Well, let's expose the value and the on change. What about something a bit more advanced, something you couldn't do in version 1? Uh, as the user is typing into an autocomplete, what if I wanted to capture that input value and treat that as a controllable prop and listen to that changing? Um, this is all the base component does, which keeps it relatively simple compared to the previous version. And that means that we also need to provide a way of sort of this control mechanism without bloating the logic internal to the component. So that's been built out with a higher order component with state. And this provided the building block that we built the much more sophisticated variations like the async and the creatable mode on top of. So basically, the default export from the package now looks like this. We get our select, and we wrap it with a state controller. The way that, actually, that state controller actually works internally, again, this is very, very much simplified, but we create a component that knows about the state. Uh, it defaults that to the value prop if it's present. We then implement a handle change mechanism that lets you take a new value, set the internal state, but also pass it up so that if a consumer is using that and still subscribing to that, it will still work as they expect. Um, we now have a get value function, which will either return the prop if it's provided or the internal state, which is kept in sync. And finally, the render process just returns our base component and controls these particular props on the way through. So we've taken a basic component that expects it to contain as little logic as possible, but we're wrapping it with much, much easier to use uh, kind of implementations where all of the complexity is siloed. Um, and this started actually going really well. This was able to be used for, if you imagine like async, what do you want to do? Listen to a value change, put the control in a loading state, wait for a promise to resolve with your new data, and then update the options array. So those become the props that the async component controls. Creatable is very similar. Check to see if that exists. If it doesn't, add a new option to the bottom of an options array saying, create this new value. Um, and this has now become very, very scalable. So we have the extensible CSS and JS styles, a fallback, because um, a lot of people will want to continue using CSS, so a fallback to built-in class names this component injection pattern, as well as controllable props. Now, we feel like we've used some things that are not new ideas in React, but we've gone pretty far with them. And you might be thinking, like, wait a minute, I heard render props are cool, 2018? Um, this was a very serious conversation. We thought, what if we should be using a render prop for this? There's another popular component called Downshift that is entirely built around this concept. Um, and render props have been unlocking a lot of really interesting patterns in React. Uh, ultimately. We didn't go this way because while they kind of provide ultimate flexibility of the implementation detail, in the case of this select component, that's actually not what we want. Um, if you think about it a different way, right, 
render props allow users to provide their own implementation. They also kind of force users to provide their own implementation. This is not often a bad thing, but in this case, uh, the intricacies of the accessibility and the touch event handling and everything else across quite a sophisticated UI block, uh, we didn't want to have that. So React Select controls the behavior and provides a default implementation. The default behavior can, to a limited extent, be controlled with props. We couldn't get away from that entirely. Uh, but you can actually extend or replace the styles and provide your own components, override the built-in logic kind of where and when you need to. But by default, if you wanted to change 5%, the other 95% is still being provided for you out of the box. You didn't have to think about how we as component authors wanted you to implement that. You don't have to know. You just get to use uh, what is already built in. So it does mean that we get to do some great support for accessibility, touch handling, and things like that in it. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I can't wait to launch it. But in the meantime, that's a preview link. Um, I know we've got a lot of stuff to get through tonight, so I might skip the live demo. Um, but do you want, yeah, I'll, I'll skip the live demo. Um, it's all the stuff that I would demo is actually on that website. And you can see we went pretty crazy. Uh, there's an experimental section where we turned a select component into a date picker. We bound the input value through a natural language parser to give you the day if you type in tomorrow or next April, um, set that as the value, and then generate an options array from the month using date functions library. So that was sort of like, whoa, OK. We might have hit on something good here when we realized we could do that. Um, learnings, uh, select a hard, don't build one. Use React Select. <laughs> it's really, trust me, you don't want this. Um, thank you very much for having me. No, that was definitely a joke. Uh, so the question was, um, I mentioned that the reason I was contributing to open source was I want more testers. Sorry, uh, very, very dry Australian humor. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't think about anyone who uses our stuff like that at all. Uh, but it was, um, there was a little bit of, of truth behind it in that I have had literally hundreds of things that have come up and been solved in this library that I don't think I would have found or solved on my own. And I've learned a ton from everyone who's contributed to it. So uh, the reason I started contributing to open source years ago was just because I wanted to. Um, and I had the time. Now it's kind of challenging. I'm a parent. I've got a two-year-old. And I found that it's so worthwhile getting that community engagement and the feedback. Um, and I feel like the work we do has a lot more reach. So that's really the driver behind actually not just contributing to open source, but also trying to encourage companies that we work with to allow us to leverage and contribute further to that. Um, yeah, big believer in, in, the, in the dream. <laughs> Good question. So the question was, when building a component like this, do I try and think about all of the use cases and architect for that up front, or do I just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks? Um, certainly for this version, uh, we spent a lot of time, like a couple of weeks. We actually cataloged all of the selects in Atlassian, and I wasn't kidding about there being thousands. Um, took screenshots, described the behavior, looked into all the variations. That was for version two. Um, so we kind of had that in our minds at the start and thought, what might we be able to do to try and approach all of these use cases? We then kind of put that to one side and actually, in the architectural phase, did throw a bunch of stuff at the wall to see what would stick. But we were testing against hundreds of hypothetical use cases. And we only really started locking it down once we knew that we could suit them all. Um, so it was kind of an experiment, test, repeat. And then eventually, your experiments become production code um, in that cycle. So a little bit of both, but really, uh, it's good to have the, all of the requirements in mind before you start building, and then keep kind of popping your head back up again and testing against all of those to make sure that you're on track and know what you can hit easily and know what, what might be challenging. Yeah. Thanks so much. Cool. Thanks.